Hello and welcome to Accelerating Your Digital Vision, a webinar series sponsored by CoForge. The, this episode and the coming ones will be about low-code, no-code, a new type of technology trend that is revolutionizing the tech space. My name is Pascal Bornet. I'm the author of the Intelligent Automation book. Uh, I'm bringing 20 plus years of consulting, implementing artificial intelligence, automation, and low-code, no-code for corporate clients. And before everything, uh, I am passionate about making our world more human with technologies. Low-code, no-code technologies are booming. I think it's the, the, the trend is uh, 20 to 30% increase per year uh, uh, over the last few years. According to Gartner, by 2025, 70% of apps will be built using low-code, no-code technology. So, and, and this resonates with, with what I've seen on the ground. Um, uh, low-code, no-code allows reducing the duration of transformations by more than 50% and, and increase significantly the scope of those transformations. So basically, companies can do more in less time, uh, solving one of the big issues that all corporates are, are, are facing currently, which is about scaling those transformations. Um, but using low-code, no-code is not a magic wand. Uh, to succeed, experience is key, and under endorsing the critical success factors is vital. Um, so we need to learn how to bike before riding. And for that, today I'm thrilled to have with me a very special guest, uh, Phil Simon. Phil, how are you today? Hey, Pascal, thanks for having me on. Doing well. How about yourself? <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, Phil, you are one of the world's leading independent experts on low-code, no-code. You are a 13 times author. So, and, and just a few months ago, you published the book Low-Code, No-Code, Citizen Developers and the Surprising Future of Business Applications. So really, um, we will talk about uh, with you about the, the, the basics around low-code, no-code, what it is, um, what are the different types of tools we can see on the market, and what are the critical success factors to, to, to implement those transformations. You are a frequent keynote speaker. You speak in... in I've seen you speaking different engagement, different um, uh, events. You are a recognized authority for all topics around collaboration and technology. And, and, um, and, and I think I should call you professor because you've, you are a professor for hire uh, and, and you've, you've, you were a professor at least for, for three years in, in the past. Um, Phil, you've helped organizations communicate, collaborate, and use technology better. Uh, you write a lot on this topic that, that, that passionates you. Uh, and I've seen your articles in Harvard Business Review. Uh, I've seen you speaking on N NBC, CNBC. Um, feel very happy to have you with us today. And um, without further waiting, let me ask you the first question. I like to say that the future of coding is no code. I know it's not from me, it's from someone else. I don't remember who, but I yeah, think it's a good Chris, uh, Wayne's right, I think I pronounced it. He was the founder and former CEO of GitHub. In fact, on the um, hardcover edition of the book, that is, that's the whole thing. Just the big quote in, I don't know, 75 point font. But yeah, when I saw yeah. that quote, I said that that has to be on the back yeah. of the book. Definitely. So this quote, I think, is, is a summary of of everything that we'll talk about. Huh? The future of coding is no code. Uh, so that's a good introduction to my first question. We hear about those buzzwords, you know, uh, uh, low code, uh, citizen developers, uh, no code, technical depth, empowering, empowering the business to build their own applications and so on. Can you help us purify all those terms? Um, what are we talking about here? What are the benefits we can get from this? And, um, and maybe starting with the difference between low code and no code. Yeah, well, again, thanks for having me on. Um, low code, no code is really a fairly new term. I only started hearing it about mm, four or five years ago, but when I researched the book, I found that I think it was someone from Forrester had coined the term in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. 
but in the past we've called the citizen developers the people who take these tools and build valuable apps business technologists um, interestingly that's not necessarily a specific role pascal in a company uh, many times and i make this point in the book it's an attribute of an existing role so you're not looking to hire a citizen developer but a marketing analyst or an accountant or a payroll manager might actually be a citizen developer because he or she can build applications using a lot of these powerful tools that I'm sure I'll talk about today. As for your question about the difference between low code and no code, I try not to overthink things. I find that many times management consultants and some of these advisory firms tend to use a bunch of jargon and I think Einstein said, if you can't explain something clearly, then you don't understand it well enough. So I, I define it very simply in the book. Uh, no code, you cannot add third-party code, period. Um, low code, you can. So for example, on my website, I use WordPress, which last time I checked runs about 40% of the web, might be up to 42 right now. And there's a theme called Divi from Elegant Themes, and that is low code. You don't have to insert jQuery or JavaScript or PHP or CSS. It'll work just fine. But if you're like me and you're a geek, you do. So it's very simple. Now, just because so, these... Maybe to make it, to make it very simple in, in terms of, I mean, uh, giving an image to, 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 to the audience, um, really the low code is what we... what when we see those interfaces where you can drag and drop mm -hmm. um, uh, items, you don't need to, to type anything, basically. And you just right. drag and drop, and yeah, you yeah, have yeah. reusable yeah, components yeah. that you can connect the one to the other on a graphical way. Oh, 100%. So um, there's an image in the book I think you're referring to or a figure about how I draw it out. So if you can use your keyboard, then it's low code. If you can use your mouse, then it's no code. Okay. And if you're um, can um, I'm sorry if you use your only your mouse that's full code, but then if it's kind of a mix, so there's a, a yin and yang symbol, uh, then it's actually uh, low code. So yes, but behind the scenes, um, you may not be aware of this. Um, if you're just an end user, and this is the whole point, there is a ton of code that's actually rendering when, to use your analogy, you drag and drop. So in the book, I use an example of a tool that I started using way back in 1997, Microsoft Access. Well, if you go into the visual view to build a query and you select a number of fields or you join tables, well, you can actually look at the SQL view and it's Jet SQL, which is different than what would run on Oracle or SQL Server, but you actually have created code, even though you didn't know it. And that's kind of the point. Um, a lot of folks really don't care too much about that type of thing. They just need an app that tracks information or a website or whatever. So to me, a, a true citizen developer is someone who doesn't have a traditional programming background, but can still, through the use of these low-code, no-code tools, build some really powerful apps. Excellent. I, I, I have the feeling that we use low-code, no-code as a term more and more uh, to designate a lot of, uh, I mean, in, in, in many technology fields, uh, the user interface, basically, huh? that, that that's more and more of the softwares that we use um, uh, are using to democratize the use of, of uh, and, and increase the number of users they can have. Uh, do, you, do you agree that more than fields really in technology, it's, it's kind of a trend that is touching all, all fields in technology, all, soft, all, all, all the software industry currently? Absolutely. The, the book contains a number of case studies from big companies and small companies. But yeah, I was pretty convinced when I decided to write this book last year that low code, no code was a burgeoning trend. If anything, I think I underestimated it. You cited a statistic about Gartner and 70%. Uh, Microsoft, I think uh, six months ago or so, predicted that of the next 450 million business apps, 400 million will be low code, no code. And when I researched the books on Amazon, I did not see very many, uh, if, if, if any, um, interesting books about citizen development and low-code, no-code. So yes, you can absolutely use it in really any business function, whether you're in HR or marketing or finance or sales. Um, it is important, and I'm sure we'll talk about this during the chat today, to realize the rec limitations of low-code, no-code. For example, Apple yeah. is not going to rip out its supply chain management system that's shipped, I think, 2.2 billion 
um, iPhones over the, over the last 15 or 16 years because of something they can do in Airtable. Uh, ditto for CRM, ditto for ERP, but there are a lot of these sort of glue applications that typically business users have had to either um, fill out requirements and submit to IT, or if they're using Scrum, they would use user stories. And one of the massive benefits of low code, no code is that the people building the software are the ones who understand what it has to do. And the IT business divide is very much alive and well. Um, there's an example in the book of um, Accenture working with um, Hertz to build a website and a mobile app. And I think they spent $32 million and couldn't get it to work. Well, I wasn't on that project and I don't know who dropped the ball, but I guarantee you the IT business divide was alive and well. Excellent. Very, very interesting uh, uh, examples that, that, that you threw up in the book. And uh, 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 we say that, and you mentioned in the book, that uh, everyone can get involved in digital transformations with, with the low-code, no-code tools. Uh, but we all know if we make an analogy with, with playing the piano, that not everyone can play the piano. Oh, I sure what? can't. <laughs> I can't as well. So uh, how can we make this work? I mean, what is your experience on that? Well, in a nutshell, I'll read the book because I address that question. But the, the shorter answer is that, um, that there are a lot of things that have to take place. Um, in some companies I've, I've seen as a consultant in my career, they will ban, forget no code, low code tools. I've had discussions with IT directors about banning Microsoft Excel. And I said, well, do you expect people to write things down or to take out a calculator? I mean, that, that's a little ridiculous. Um, yeah, there is, I agree with you, um, a chasm. Some people, I'm a geek, uh, are not like me, right? They, they are not curious about yeah. how things work. I did not yeah. study. Um, the last time I took a proper programming course was in 1991, and I learned Pascal, and I'm pretty sure they don't teach that anymore. Now, I did yeah. teach myself in my days as a college professor some Python and some other tools, and certainly being an independent, I've had to learn things for myself, but not everyone is like me, and that's not a bad thing. Some people would say that's a very good thing. Um, but for the folks that want to become true citizen developers, and I make this point, I think, in chapter 10, um, they need to understand that citizen developers are still developers. So if you're building, say, in Notion or in Airtable, just something for yourself, then if you discover a bug, then it only really affects you. Um, you don't have to train yourself how to use it because you built the thing. But if you're a citizen developer and you're creating a tool that you're going to have eight to 10 other people use, then you do need to train them and you do need to communicate to them if you found a problem. You do need to train new employees on how to use them. So these are things that traditional software developers just sort of nod their head and say, well, yeah. But again, this isn't necessarily a book for traditional software developers, although it's interesting, Pascal, as I researched the book, I found plenty of proper developers who used Airtable and used other low-code, no-code tools because it was just easier. There's one example of a Medium post that I found about a guy who built in a complete expense tracking app in 10 minutes. Now he used some Python scripts and some API calls, but he also used Airtable and he explained it and he said, well, why should I reinvent the wheel? This works really well, really quickly. It's going to save me a couple of hours of coding. So yeah, there's an entire chapter. I think it's 12 about myths that people have about no code, low code and citizen developers. And a big one is that this is only stuff that, um, can only, that, that real developers would never use. I, I think that's nonsense. Yes. And, and I, I laughed uh, alone when I, when I, I read um... Your, defini your definition of three types of people in the world when it comes to technology innovation. Can you, can you, can yeah, you elaborate? That was, that was amazing. I've discovered this over my years as a consultant and even when I was a college professor. So this is a very um, simplified view of things, but um, to, in the immortal words of the statistician George E.P. Box, all models are wrong, essentially, but some are useful. Hopefully this is useful. So there are people who get it, right? You wrote a book about automation. You understand how silly it is to have people do things over and over again in a manual way. They're going to make errors. It's not cost effective. Um, it's not fun. I mean, no one likes doing that. Those are folks, you and me, no problem. Um, yeah. Then there are folks that I think are really interesting. Those are the folks that don't get it, but want to get it. And I remember when I lived in Las Vegas um, and I bought a home that had no 
um, landscaping, but there was land. So I hired a landscaper. And when I found him, his website, this was back in 2011, um, his website looked at like it had been built in 1997. It wasn't responsive. Um, it looked terrible on my phone. You'd have to do horizontal scrolling. We've all seen sites like that. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, Jeff, knock a couple thousand dollars off the palm trees and I will build you a very dynamic WordPress contemporary site and hopefully it'll help you generate more business. He said, fine. And then he'd come over to look at the irrigation or the grass because I know a lot about computers. I know a few things about writing, hopefully a few things about no code, low code, but I don't know anything about building a backyard. I don't know anything about how you would lay pipe. And he brought a WordPress book and he said, okay, I figured out how to embed a YouTube video in my sidebar. I, I love those kinds of people. Um, and then there's the third group. The, the uh, those, those are the, yeah, the most motivated people. They want to get it. They, uh, you, you just give them the uh, opportunity to educate themselves. They will get it by themselves. Um, yeah. yeah. And and it, those, I mean, yeah. from my experience, now those people, those are in terms of change management, those people who will go through the transformation of themselves by educating themselves and will share this with the others. It's kind of a, they, they will infuse this uh, this uh, willingness to know more and to do more with this, and I, I, I really like this type of of people. I mean, I I I push them in 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 change management, in communication to uh, to infuse the 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 word about the transformation. Yeah, and this it, is a guy it, with it, 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 yeah, it, the, it, and I, the third one. Sorry, the the the, the third type of people. Right. Uh, so before I get to that, um, and this was a guy who was 55 years old. So a lot of people stop mm -hmm. learning when they get to a certain yes. point in life. There was a guy at my gym who used to go That's there amazing. and he was probably 82 years old. And I saw him with a calculus book and with a Python book. And at one point I talked to him and I could just tell that we had a lot in common because if I make it to 82 years old, I still want to be learning things. So the, the third group is the one that I really try to avoid. Those that don't get it and don't want to get it. We've all encountered folks like that. Uh, whether you've been a consultant or internally, and they're just looking for a reason not to do something, no matter what benefits a particular application or system or technology or framework or process offer, uh, there's always a reason not to do it. And of course, there's a reason not to do something. But too often, I find that we focus on the costs of inaction. And, and certainly the same holds true, Pascal, with respect to citizen development. You can absolutely say, well, Airtable doesn't do this or Mendix doesn't do that. And fine, I'll concede the point, but look at what you can get very quickly. There are lots of case studies in the book about companies that were able to roll out new enhancements or new applications in weeks that would have taken months or, or possibly a year to get that extra 5%. So you know, it's incumbent, mm -hmm. getting back to one of your previous questions, for IT departments to basically wave the flag on, on shadow IT. Um, you can't tell folks in a rapidly changing world, and they've got new needs for applications because of COVID, that we'll get to it. We'll look at it in a year. Or why don't you go find a third-party developer because that also introduces problems. So if you've got people who are ready, willing, and able to build and maintain these tools, I, I think it's silly to stop them from building things that are actually going to help them and take things off your plate. And there's a statistic from, I think it's Salesforce that I quote in the book from 2018 about how 72% of senior IT leaders didn't have the resources to focus on their strategic priorities. And now we've got people saying, give me more, give me more. So something has to give. Fortunately, that something is no code, low code, and the tools are mature enough to think that I think they're ready for prime time. Excellent. So, so, so the, the third group that we talked about, the, those guys who don't get it and don't want to get it, they definitely are, are the largest issue that we need to solve in change management to succeed in such a transformation. And I think, um, I mean, what comes to my mind is really to use the first two groups. So the, the people who get it and fix it and the people who don't get it but want to get it to, to kind of... Um, uh, change the mind of of the third group. Huh? Um, I, I think this is really critical because this is because of the last group that very often uh, those transformations will fail. Uh, what is your view on how to solve the issue of the third group? I don't know that you can. Uh, some 
cases, it may be a serious discussion about whether or not you really want to work in this field or in this position or at this company. But I mean, the world changes. I'm hard pressed to think of too many things that have remained the same in my lifetime. And when you think about some of the recent developments around generative AI and around RPA and some of the things I'm researching for my current book, you know, I understand why someone like Elon Musk wants to turn back the clock. And there are certainly a lot of executives rooting for him. So we don't want employees to work at home, even though all the productivity data suggests that they've been more productive at home. Um, so I understand why people want to go back, but um, I, I, I don't see how it's possible. We've had close to three years now of largely remote, if not hybrid work. It's allowed us to really change our lives. I saw some statistics the other day from a working paper about how the um, average American saved 55 minutes per day, not commuting. And in China, it was 102 minutes. So if you think about what you could do with that time back, whether it's exactly. exercise or uh, cook, if that's your hobby or spend time with your families. So I, I really do think that no code, low code can contribute to that because you now can reduce the amount of time that you're spending going back and forth in Slack or Microsoft Teams or email. I thought you meant this. No, you meant that. The people who are building the apps are the same ones who are using it. So by definition, <laughs> there is no chasm um, now they may go back to the software vendor and say, I don't understand why this isn't working, but in my experience, and my first book is called why new systems fail. It isn't because there was a bug in the software. It was because someone forgot to set something up. It was because mm -hmm. someone forgot to test something. It was because someone forgot to go to training or somebody forgot to uh, look at the data before we loaded it in the system. So the, the, the factors are typically human. And I do think that low code, no code. Um, can really pay off in spades. And hopefully the book will encourage people to actually give these things a shot because they're so much more powerful than they used to be when they were standalone applications that you could run on a desktop. I mean, now you can, with automation tools that you know far more about than I do, whether it's Zapier or Workato or Make.com, you can actually go across different applications and save so much time just in terms of data entry, uh, never mind actually uh, pulling in data from different sources and analyzing it. I mean, there are so many benefits of these tools. I, I just don't feel like there's a reason not to use them. It completely makes sense. And I think companies, I mean, I've seen it successful when companies were incentivizing their, their people to use such tools. Um, uh, uh, for example, in, in including uh, into their their KPIs, their their, their um, key performance indicators of each and every one, the the fact that they have built tools to improve their productivity or to improve the quality of of, of the outcomes they produce. So, in embedding this into the KPIs, I've seen it uh, as working very well, especially so for for this third group of people, which are the most difficult to convince. Uh, I've had a really tough time convincing them over my career because there's some, um, there's a great quote from, I think it was George Bernard Shaw about denial. Um, it's, 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 just, I have tried all sorts of different techniques as a consultant. I'm sure you have too, about trying to sell the benefits or framing yes. the issue in such a way that it's only natural for them to arrive at a certain place. But to quote one of my favorite movies, cool hand Luke with Paul Newman, gosh, now probably 50, 60 years ago, some men you just can't reach. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with you. Completely agree with you. Um, Phil, a, a bit of... Um, a, 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 I would like to ask you a question that is a bit... Um, a bit... Uh, a bit tough. Um, Phil, we've talked about uh, everyone in the company uh, being able to... being empowered to build their own tools using those low-code, no-code technologies uh, and we've talked about all the benefits around increasing the speed of the of of the transformation and um, and getting those those people to to use those technologies uh, actually more. But usually, IT is here in the company to build those tools. Um, so, what is now the role of IT? Do we still need IT? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and look, you know as well as I that IT is a monolithic term. I mean, DevOps started to gain traction, what, about eight to 10 years ago? And it, as an umbrella term, it encompasses both the development side and the operation side. So it's a fallacy to think that the same folks that want to build cool stuff 
are, are thinking also about security or about hacks or securing the perimeter. So there's absolutely a role for IT. And, and I'm not saying in the book or, or now that no code, low code can do absolutely everything. It can't. I also don't think that it's going to supplant the need for proper programmers. But it's tough to hire these folks. They're expensive. There's a study that I quote in the book on um, University of Chicago, and they analyzed, I think it was, um, I forget how many IT jobs, but 100% of them could be performed remotely. Well, now if you're going to mandate that people come back to the office, they're not going to do that. There was the head of, I think it was machine learning at Apple back in March of uh, last year, promptly quit because management said, you need to come back to the office. He goes, no, I don't. <laughs> and he's got a job uh, with a deep learning division of Google, well, probably within 24 hours of deciding to quit. So IT, certainly to get back to your question, has got a role. There are going to be certain applications, ERP, CRM, um, supply chain management, bespoke applications, um, product lifecycle management, those types of things that have been around for decades. We're not going to replace them with low code, no code, but does IT really need to be involved if someone needs to create a, a miniature website or a web form? The answer is no. Um, and if those apps need to integrate, then through the APIs or some of the automation tools that I mentioned in the book, there's, it, there's a way to do that. Um, there are plenty of thing, reasons that you may not want to use no code, low code. For example, I know over in Europe, they take privacy a lot more seriously than they would do here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, was it uh, GD, was it GDPA, GDPR? GDPR, yeah. yeah. Right. We don't have anything like that here, but we certainly mm -hmm. have laws around healthcare information like HIPAA. So there may be a reason, and I make this point in the book, that you don't want to store certain information in, in something unless it's HIPAA compliant or, or certified as such. But you're still you're not talking about eliminating IT, but maybe IT is only responsible for certain types of development. You know, I, I mean, if you're creating your own app in Airtable or Notion or Coda, then maybe you are in charge of the maintenance of that and handling support tickets, and you're okay with that. But there are going to be all sorts of other apps or systems that you're not going to support. So IT doesn't go away, but it can maybe focus on the, the harder problems that do require, to use your analogy, the keyboard and not necessarily the mouse. It completely makes sense. And I was thinking if we push further in 20 years from now, um, as we see this trend of low code touching all and every software product on the market, um, we might think that uh, even those hardwares and more, more complex systems that are currently uh, in the scope of IT might be easier to manage in the future. And, um, and probably the, the skills that are required from an IT department will, will change in the future uh, and might be more about program management, um, maintenance, uh, ensuring that the standards are, are, are followed and that we are kind of building um, tools that are, that are consistent across the company. Do you think there would be a shift of the IT skills from less technical to more um, program management and, um, and governance, I would say? So that, that gets into a really fascinating area. So I want to say in, was it 2000, Mark Andreessen famously said software is eating the world. And right on the front of my website, and this is as far as I know my own quote, I'm a big fan, but occasionally I come up with something interesting to say on my own. Every company is a tech company. Some just haven't realized it yet. So if, and I said this to my students as a college professor, if you don't do technology or you don't do data, um, it's going to be increasingly difficult for you to, to find a job, especially when you think about all the automation and some of the recent advance, advance, advances in generative AI. Um, yeah, it's possible that IT folks might be more program managers, but you're, you're talking, um, Pascal, about this fundamental tension between governance, which to me is very centralized, and there are reasons for that, and they're not all bad, and citizen development, which is fundamentally democratic. So citizen developers might go off and build their own things. And there's this chapter in the book in which I lay out five or six different management philosophies around them from, okay, we're going to approve a certain number of tools versus a single vendor approach, whether that's SAP or Microsoft with its power apps, or if you're going to let everyone do their own thing. Well, if you're, let, if you're applying a laissez-faire approach, which is probably only two French words that I know, other than merci, bonjour, um, 
that's kind of at odds. So I do think that low code, no code is going to force some companies to look at their program management and look at their governance structures, because if it's so strict that you're basically doing citizen development, but it's preventing the folks, the citizens from actually developing, then, then what, you know, people are going to leave. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of citizen developers for the book and fundamentally they shared a bunch of characteristics, one of which was that they hated inefficiency. And another one was that they wanted to solve problems. So they would actually spend hours researching how to do something. There was an example in the book of someone who took over a job and there was a manual process that took her a week. She got it down to a day, then she got it down to an hour, then she got it down to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, that That's, to me yeah. is, is an incredible example of the power. And she wasn't a developer, right? She didn't write a mm -hmm. Python script and automate all this. She just used the tools that were out there. So yeah, I do think that IT's roles will have to look at, but if you're going to impose a structured sense of governance on what is fundamentally a decentralized type of thing, there, there are going to be some problems there. Yes, and, and um, that, that's a perfect transition to my next question. Uh, if, if everyone is empowered in the company to build their own tools, um, can we end up with a big mess huh, of oh, non-standard, redundant, difficult to maintain applications? Um, how can companies avoid such issues and, and how to build the right governance? And uh, uh, I mean, is there a secret recipe? And, and I, I remember a story that you tell uh, that, that, uh, that you, that you uh, talk about in the book. Uh, I think it's in Rotterdam, the... Um, uh, I don't know if, if it's the town hall or the municipality of Rotterdam, mm -hmm. where they have built the right balanced governance to make it work. Yeah, it, it's very difficult that things are decentralized to get people to change, right? See our previous discussion about that. And, and I've been writing mm -hmm. about this in a number of books, even going back to um, Reimagining Collaboration, which was my first book in this series on the future of work. I just find it interesting if you some departments use Slack and another set of departments use Teams. Well, where does the conversation take place? That's why software like Mio exists. It's basically this bridge that connects the two, but in theory, it shouldn't exist because we should all be able to agree on a collaboration hub. Or if you're using Zoom and we are using WebEx and people were not mm -hmm. authorized to use WebEx, we're not authorized to use Zoom. Well, then you have, again... <laughs> problems about just getting on the call. And this is why people start to get frustrated with remote work. So yes. there, there isn't a secret sauce. And again, in the book, I lay out some of the management philosophies. And, and even in chapter seven, there's a case study of one company, um, Synergics Education. They're an ed tech startup here in Arizona. I'm friends with the CIO. And we went to lunch and we started talking. And he said, we're a complete Microsoft shop. So if Microsoft makes it, we use it. If they don't, we won't. And when Power Apps comes out and it allows them to customize Dynamics 365, that's great. They don't have to mess around with um, Zapier or Workato because they've got Power Automate. So mm -hmm. in that case, okay, use, use whatever you want with Microsoft. Now, there are other companies that say, well, we've approved three or four tools. Other companies might say, well, we're evaluating three or four tools. We'll let you know what we sanction. But yeah, I mean, there is such a thing as too much choice. You're 100% right. There's a famous study from this guy, Barry Schwartz, in his book, The Paradox of Choice, that got a lot of play 10 or 12 years ago about how at a mall, they put out 40 types of jam and something like 6% of people mm -hmm. selected one because they didn't want to make the wrong choice. Conversely, when they put out six types of jam, 40% of people said, oh, I like blueberry or I like strawberry. Um, and I think the same thing apl applies to low code, no code. There are so many tools. And as we hear about layoffs and some of the consolidation, interest rates going up, some of the startups are going to look at a down round. There will be some shakeouts. I saw on LinkedIn a couple of days ago about how one company received additional funding at half of its previous evaluation. So companies like SAP, Microsoft, Google, um, Salesforce will certainly be on the hunt because they can purchase some of these companies at a discount. But no, there, you, you're right. You can't have seven people using seven different tools <laughs> because mm. it, it just becomes untenable and more expensive. I saw uh, a lot of Microsoft customers were getting a little angry with software as a service. They were paying for all these tools that they didn't need. They say, well, we're paying for seven tools. We only want, uh, we're using seven tools. We only want to pay for seven tools. So again, these are just issues. That's why I think it's a 270 page book. I didn't want to write a 500 page book because no one would read it. 
But yeah, these yes. are these are a lot of issues that I talk about with clients and in, in shows like this one. So it's about it's about finding the right balance between um, adopting each and every tool on the market for each and every need uh, of, of each and every department in the company um, to uh, um, pushing everyone to use the same platform that is supposed to to manage all the needs. Uh, from from all departments. I mean, I it's can't tell. You're not finding the right balance between maybe maybe at the end of the day, two three platforms can be can be a load in the company to be used, so that yeah, you I, can I, manage the costs, manage the maintenance and the and the skills around using those tools. Is it is it? Do you think it is the right balance to to reach? Yeah, I mean. I, That seems like a reasonable number to me, but by the same token, this is a conceptual book that will hopefully have some legs. If I wrote Slack for dummies or Zoom for dummies like I did, mm -hmm. then those books were basically dated within two months of coming out. Um, this is a conceptual book. Um, I can't tell you that in chapter 13, there's a flow chart. So if you're a healthcare company based in France and you have 2000 employees, then you should use these tools. But if you're a startup in the US in finance and you've got 37 employees, you should use that tool. And that just isn't practical. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to me to use seven different flavors of Airtable um, for financial reasons and, and other ones. And there's also this notion of vendor lock-in. There may be a better tool than whatever, but yes. migrating from that tool, as you know, can be difficult. And even though um, vendor lock-in is, is different in a world of software as a service, it might be able to get your data out. There isn't a magic button right, in Mendix that all of a sudden converts it to an SAP tool. And I, I suspect mm -hmm. that there never will be. So at some point you might say, well, we're, we're stuck with this tool for now, but maybe we're going to evaluate a different one. But no, it, it's crazy to have 10 or 12 different tools that do the same thing, but it might not make sense for whatever reason just to use one tool. There may be a key feature in one of them that warrants getting yes. through it. In fact, um, My, my friend Lowell from that company in Arizona had said, we know when we sign up for Microsoft that some of the features that the smaller best of breed vendors create will come later. Like for example, uh, Slack clips, asynchronous video, basically loom um, inside of Slack. Well, Microsoft released that 10 months after Slack did just because Microsoft's a lot bigger than Slack, even though Slack is part of Salesforce. So um, yeah, somewhere between two and 15, there's probably happy medium. Completely, completely aligned with you on that. I, I want, I want to be, before we end this discussion, I want to come back on on the case of um, the municipality of Rotterdam that you that you shared in your book. Um, I like it because it, I think it's very aligned with my experience on how to make local no code transformations stick in companies. Um, as we discussed now about using different tools, but even if you use one tool, and this was the case of the municipality of Rotterdam. They chose, I don't remember which tool. Um, they went into it and I think they, they've been able to, to build the right governance between uh, letting the users, the business users build their tools, build their, their programs um, and still managing the standards, um, making sure that what is being built by the business is not redundant. Um, And, and, and can be then main, maintained by IT. Uh, they, if I understand well, they created some champions in, in the user's team that kind of connected with the central authority. Um, and, uh, can, you, can, can you explain in more detail? Because I think that's really the right balance to get in terms of governance to avoid, to avoid a mess, basically. Yeah, of, look, of, you, you don't want it to be... So for those people who haven't read the book yet, hopefully you'll check it out. Um, but I like that case study because of a number of reasons. First, they used a single tool, Mendex. And in the past, they had a whole bunch of disparate systems that were difficult to maintain and govern, and they were expensive. They weren't, mo they weren't mobile. Um, so with Mendex, they found a single solution. But that's also public sector. And here in the United States, as well as other parts of the world, unfortunately, things are very polarized. And it's very popular to dunk on government. I know that the Pew Research Center has shown that consistently, at least in the United States, trust in institutions, particularly the government is not high. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. 
particularly in the United States back in 2010, I think it was when healthcare.gov launched and it went down and it was a mess. And if you read any of the postmortems on that, you realize that it doesn't matter if it was public sector, or private sector, it was just kind of a disaster. So on one hand with, with Rotterdam, to get back to your example, they did want some kind of governance. They didn't want anyone launching anything uh, because the apps that they were building, the, at least the ones that I profile in the book, were around things like if you were visiting, you needed a parking permit or if you had a traffic ticket or things along that nature. So you do want there to be some type of governance and, and testing and all that. But at the same time, they're believers in the rapid application development. So rapid and governance, again, are kind of at odds. Governing something typically doesn't lend itself to that. In fact, Facebook is famous for move fast and break things. Well, at Facebook, there wasn't a lot of governance and we all know all the problems that uh, Facebook, or I should say Meta now, has caused. So I, I don't focus too much in the book on the, the governance aspect of it, but clearly they were aware of what's going on. And they did find that happy middle ground between getting things out quickly, empowering the citizen developers, but not stifling them. And I think, as I think about some of the potential detriments of citizen development succeeding the way that I know it can, it's the old school I, you know, CIO who's 60 years old and is retiring in four years and is in that third group, doesn't want it and doesn't want to get it. Um, when in reality, there's something else. Of course, we need to do testing. Of course, we need governance. We can't have everyone doing everything with sensitive data. That's a given. But that doesn't mean that we should try to replicate some of the problems that got us to this point. Because I'll tell you, Pascal, if IT were able to meet the internal customer's needs as quickly, I, I firmly believe that the citizen development of the low-code, no-code tools wouldn't be nearly as popular. It wasn't like people mm -hmm. wanted to anger their IT folks. They said, look, we need something, right? I mean, shadow mm -hmm. IT has been around really for what, 20 years, ever since Benioff came up with SaaS and then with cloud computing, you had um, decentralized purchasing. You didn't go through a single procurement department. So I'd say to the CIOs who are listening, um, governance is important. But don't look for a reason to nip citizen development in low-code, no-code tools in a bud. They're doing you a favor. You're taking things off your plate. They're building apps for you. Yeah. Let them. It, it comes from necessity. Yeah. And, and definitely, it really reinforces the collaboration between IT and, and business. And, and I think that's, that's a key, key aspect of it. Yeah. Um, Phil, thank you so much for all these insights. Um, can you, can you tell us where we can find your book? Yeah, it's pretty much everywhere you'll find books, um, you know, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or um, IndieBound or whatever. And you know, if you want to download samples, if you go to my website, philsimon.com, you can find an audio sample. Uh, you can find uh, chapter one of the book as a PDF. But yeah, I hope people will check it out. Thank you, Pascal. I really enjoyed the discussion. Th thank you, Phil. And we can find you on social media. You're very active. I follow you as well. Uh, uh, um, before we end up this, this great discussion, just a, a summary of the key points we discussed. Uh, uh, what I really loved is when we discussed those uh, three types of people uh, and, and their reaction to, to, to technology innovation, and especially no code, no code, and how to, how to make it stick with each of them, and especially with the third group. Um, I loved when, when we talked, of course, about what is low-code, no-code, what is the difference between low-code and no-code. Um, uh, we, we pushed it a little bit when we talked about what, our, what is this, the role of IT. Do we still need IT today if, if we have those applications? And, uh, and what is the new role and how it's going to evolve in the future? Um, I found it very, very interesting. Uh, and finally, yes, of course, how, how to manage the right governance um, to succeed those transformations, and finally, how to choose the right tool, best of breed versus integrated platforms. Phil, thank you so much for this insight. That was really great. Uh, and before we end up, I want to thank uh, CoForge again for the great support to make this webinar possible. And to the audience, thanks for watching. Uh, I will we'll see you soon for the next episode of Accelerating Your Digital Vision with local no code. See you.